the right button. Well, good day, all. You are in the right room. We're going to have a great time. Today's session is Beyond the Academy, expanding Sakai's reach into the for-profit realm. So this session is considered a birds of a feather, and it's being led by the famous Martin Ramsey, who has been the managing director of a LAMP Learning Consortium since 2006. LAMP is a community of colleges, universities, and other learning organizations that share Sakai, Big Blue Button, Warp Wire, and other technologies to help support teaching and learning. Martin has been a consultant with Seath Company since 1993, helping clients on four, four continents. I almost said 14, but there aren't four, four continents and into 13 different countries to improve, helping them to improve their processes and develop their people through technology and training. He's the author of two books, Lightly Salted Stories and The Possum Principles, as well as being very active in the Sakai and Aperio communities. To enable screen reader support, press uh, Command Option Z. And to learn about shortcuts, press Command Slash. So I'm not really sure where that came from in your bio, but I thought I'd read it anyway. I didn't put that there, but I bet Wilma did. It's important. <laughs> <laughs> very good. And so I turn it over to Martin. All right. Thank you very much. And so since this is a birds of a feather, I'm hoping that it'll be very interactive. And thank you folks who have joined. Um, I know some of you, some of you I don't, um, but let me, if I may, I'll, I'll give a little background uh, to sort of set up the conversation. And then frankly, I hope I've got a series of questions that I would like to just sort of ask uh, topics that we could discuss. But first, just to give you a little bit of background, um, the LAMP Learning Consortium that I'm the managing director of is a shared instance of Sakai, which is kind of strange uh, because most of you all probably have your own instance of Sakai, but we actually share it between multiple organizations. I've lost track of how many. I'm going to say 25, 26 now. Um, we seem to be adding new ones every every week or two. Um, but we take care of the hosting and the support services so that an organization that joins the LAMP Consortium doesn't have to worry about sort of the technical heavy lifting, if you will, um, to make it work. So when, when folks come to us, they are often just basically saying, I, I need an LMS. I want to focus on teaching and learning. I, I don't know how to do all that technical stuff. And we say, you don't need to worry about that. Um, we'll, we'll take care of it. I, right now, Laura, you might get a kick out of this. I'm, I'm talking to the Caribbean Polytechnic Institute in Jamaica, don't you know, man? Um, and they have designed some beautiful courses, but you know the, the, how, how they do the technology is, is not their thing. So uh, I think that we're a good fit for them. Another thing that we do because we share the, the, sec the the technology is it reduces costs. I mean, just to be blunt, we, we share the cost among our members. And so it, it makes things less expensive. It makes it affordable. Um, and frankly, um, and Laura knows this, I hope you will agree, Laura, we're, we, we kind of like each other. We're a good community of people that uh, enjoy each other's uh, company and, and like supporting each other and collaborating with each other and so forth. Nod your head, Laura, if you think that's true. Otherwise, don't say anything. <laughs> When visiting, you certainly give off that impression. Okay, <laughs> there you go. Um, so what we are seeing, and the reason for this birds of a feather presentation or talk is that we're seeing a lot of not, what I'm gonna call non-academic educators who are interested in uh, Sakai. And the, the list is kind of interesting. I, I did a talk just a half an hour ago on, on some of the, who those members are. Um, but they are nonprofit organizations, um, and I'll just give you an example. I'm, I'm fighting off an email right now from an organization that helps children with club feet, people that are, children that are born with club feet and need surgery. Um, and so they basically, uh, it looks like, as near as I can tell, they try to um, solve that problem across the globe, and they need to be able to do some kind of training. I don't know what yet, but they're a nonprofit. And so they're the kind of folks that are sort of saying, hey, I think we could use Sakai. It would be really good. But on the other hand, we have uh, for-profit companies that use it for internal use. So for example, Sodexo, the big food services company based in France, um, multinational Fortune 500 company is using Sakai for their internal uh, um, dietetics internship program. 
So, you know, totally different use. Um, on the other hand, we have companies that are actually selling their content. You know, I have a course in this and this and this. Would you like to buy it? And they deliver it by Sakai. We're getting lots of associations um, that are saying, you know, my members need X. Example would be our Editorial Freelancers Association. If you're an, a, a freelance editor in the U.S., you're probably a member of that group, and they do all their training through Sakai. Churches and synagogues, even individuals, are saying, you know, I could use Sakai. So, the 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 thing that we're seeing is that there are a lot of these non-academic educators that are interested in Sakai. And so, my question is, what does this mean for the Sakai community? And that's the reason I wanted to have this this talk. So um, let me pause, Laura, and say, are there comments at this point, anything that I should add? I've got five questions or topics I'd like to discuss, but before I get into it, what do people have to say so far? It... Surprisingly, folks have been quiet in the chat, but maybe someone would be brave enough to open their microphone. Well, let me ask this question. Um, let me put it this way. Could we go around the room and just get a sense of why you're here? Like, I know Chris. Chris and I have met before. Chris, why are you here? <laughs> what, what made you attend this? <laughs> nope. The other way around, Chris. You had it on mute already. Yeah, open the you, mic. You, you just can... muted it. Um, okay. Sorry. Now there can you, you hear go. Me? Now you got it. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, I, I actually um, was curious about this. You had mentioned this when we had talked, right. and um, I actually uh, have a relative who does work uh, uh, with lean manufacturing, Six Sigma, oh, yeah. Yeah. that type of thing, yep. and has a bunch of corporate customers. And I was just kind of curious to see if this was uh, the, if the model that you you're talking about is something that's appropriate for like a for-profit entity like his and where he could house a lot of his different trainings and things. He spent a week with oh, me yeah. recently. So I heard a lot of what he was doing with his clients and it just kind of jogged, jogged my memory. And so I thought I'd check cool. it out. Cool. Um, just FYI, when Ford, the Ford Motor Company started its Lean Manufacturing Institute, they contracted me to build um, one of their lean manufacturing uh, simulations for them. I did it with Lego bricks. And so, uh, you know, I, I, Ford Motor Company is a customer of mine <laughs> and, and it's because of lean manufacturing. So there you go. I'm that's, that's cool. cool. All right. Let me go around the room. Um, I, I don't know everybody else who's here, but um, D Hearn, whoever you are. Will Hi. You... <laughs> Hi. Yeah, I'm Dave. Um <clears throat> Yeah, I work for a company that uh, we, we actually use Sakai for uh, K through 12 uh, schools, if you will, usually in conjunction with the school district, you know, to augment their resources. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we find some unique challenges uh, because our traditionally our uh, sites are not cohort based. I mean, the student can start it in at any time. And, you know, um, so we, you know, we can often tailor, uh, you know, our classes to meet uh, situations like, like students that have a, um, like a sports injury or something like that. And we uh -huh. just need to fill in. Uh, so yeah, you know, the typical semester starts now and final exams happen in December, you know, is not our model. It doesn't so, work for you. Yeah. I'm sorry. That doesn't work for you. No, it doesn't. Right. Well, actually, now with COVID, you know, we're finding that, you know, we've, yeah, we've partnered once again with school districts that it is more cohort based, but that's, that's sort of an exception to yeah. our business. Oh, that's really interesting. Thanks yeah. for sharing that. Yep, and sure. it, it makes me think of a, a relatively new member who joined us. It's a, it's a new charter school uh, in Toledo, Ohio. It's mm -hmm. called the, mm, it's a, it's a science and technology Institute, but it's a K-12 um, uh, group, maybe they're not 12, maybe it's K, I'm not sure, eight or something like that. Um, but, okay. but they're, you know, they're, I don't know, we're, we're talking about that. And there's another group that's joined us. It's based in St. Louis, uh, sorry, Washington University in St. Louis, but they are, they are helping public schools become more effective. And they're working with public schools in Santa Fe, New Mexico, I think, of all places. So, you know, th this idea of working with, with people who are helping schools is very much uh, part of the wheelhouse too. So that's that's really cool. That's good. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, 
So Nava El Maliki, are you willing to talk to us? I'm here, yes. <laughs> so tell That's us what you're joining for. Well, um, I'm actually um, uh, um, working at Illinois State University okay. as a GA. And I'm actually curious about this um, transformation of uh, Sakai and the future of Sakai. I've been using Sakai since um, June and helping faculty with their transition. And I've been to some other calls today about gamification and having some accessibility issues um, I've sorted through. So uh -huh. I'm just in a discovery phase, I'd say. <laughs> Wonderful. So is ISU using Sakai? Yes, yes. I didn't know it. that. Laura probably yes. knew that, but I didn't. Okay. Fine. It was the first LMS um, and the only one <laughs> we stayed for. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Wonderful. That's great. Okay. So now I'm going to the last, say I've been saving the last one because I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, so Cora Joe, Cora's, Co <laughs> there we go. Oh, it's, it's, he turned his screen on so I can see him. All right. Yeah. No, this is, sorry about that. That That's, my, my, my name is Joe Kozar. Uh, I am oh. one of the uh, developers at UD. I, I work with David oh, Bauer. Oh, okay. Uh, so you, you work with David Bauer? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, he, he, okay. He, he, he is my supervisor. And um, okay. I am in this one because honestly, I saw the title and it had never occurred to me before that Sakai would be used outside of universities. Like, like the idea of doing it in K-12 uh, makes a lot of sense now that I think about it. But the idea of using it in these kind of private like training uh, settings, mm -hmm. especially having been, uh, but before I was a Sakai developer, I worked at a company that makes like auto dealer management software. And there was a whole variety of things that I had. Okay, so I got to ask Reynolds and Reynolds or ADT? No, it, it, it was it was Reynolds and Reynolds. Uh, okay. <laughs> they, 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 they got in the news uh, a little bit recently. They're, 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 I, I won't get into that. No, don't get into that. <laughs> Uh, but, while I was there, I had a whole variety of different things that I had to train on. I worked in multiple departments and there was no standardization in their online training platforms and things like that. So right. kind of looking back and wondering what it, what, what it would have been like, how it might have been better if they had used something like Sakai for right. all of their different trainings across departments and things like that, that would have made you. support and many other different things about that, even just the usage on my end much easier. Well, so, okay, so I'll, I'll come back and ask you a question about that in a, in a little bit, but I, that's really fascinating. I mean, I, because I did a lot of work in automotive, I know Reynolds and Reynolds and ADT both quite well. Uh, I used to go into dealerships, uh, particularly for General Motors, and, uh, you know, particularly dealerships that were in trouble and, and try to help them out. And, and one of the questions is, okay, so what software are you using? Or the answer, if the answer was, we're not, that was usually a bad sign. So, you yeah. know, <laughs> okay, well, so thank you all for being willing to, to talk about yourselves a little bit. Let me, let me now pose some things to talk about. Um, so we, I guess we've already talked about that. Why are you here? You know, um, are you currently working with non-academic educators? I think we've really addressed this one already. Um, and so that maybe I can go on, go on to the second topic. Uh, but the second topic is, so what are the benefits of expanding Sakai's reach beyond the traditional academy? And, and Joe Koza, are you what, what would you say? I mean, you said, I'd never thought about it before. Um, do you see some advantages to having some other types of organizations using Sakai or do you think that could be problematic? I mean, I, I can think of more, I, I can think of advantages sooner than I can think of disadvantages, mostly from a contribution perspective. The idea mm -hmm. of, the, the, I mean, at, at UD, what we've been able to do uh, as far as customizing Sakai to our own needs has been, has allowed us to contribute back some, some interesting uh, stuff. For, for example, we, we made some changes to the attendance tool last year that were- yeah, For which we are eternally grateful, by the way. We, oh, oh, we use the attendance tool a lot. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I, I think a lot of people do. It's, uh, so, 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 so thank you for that. Um, it was, it was now, now granted that was not so much a, a functionality customization that we were doing as much as just some cosmetic changes that were specifically in response to stuff that our own faculty concerns, our own faculty had raised. Mm -hmm. And, and just that ability to 
do what you want with Sakai, uh, w whether the community wants to then take those changes or not, is, is always something that I come back to with Sakai. It's, and, and I think that expanding its reach into these very non-university settings uh, is just going to greatly increase the depth of customization that is available to anyone who's entering the community. Mm. Uh, particularly, it, it would, for, for some private company like a Reynolds and Reynolds to decide to start using Sakai as an online training platform, mm -hmm. they would then become potentially Sakai contributors. Uh, Reynolds and Reynolds in particular is a weird example of that because their development philosophy is very much the opposite of open source, uh, <laughs> well, whatever that would be nominally, but uh, Nonetheless, that well, any, any, any kind of private contributor like that would have great potential to share back yeah. very much unique changes to the community that would then make it more attractive. It, it's just something that would snowball, I think. It, it's it's, it's uh, Right. So I, I've put up the third discussion topic on the screen because it's kind of related to the second topic. And I want to hear from the rest of you. Are there any concerns about expanding into the non-academic realm and, and one of the things that you said, Joe, made me think about was um, a Reynolds and Reynolds, using them as an example. And I have run into other examples that, that are like this as well. They don't get open source at all. Um, they basically have this notion of, if I develop it, it's mine. And there's this whole proprietary thing that we would have to break apart. Um, and I, I, that strikes me as being difficult, not impossible, but difficult and something to, to think about. So what about some of the rest of you? What do you think? Chris, what thoughts do you have? Yeah, I mean, that's I'm, I'm kind of thinking through or wrapping my mind around the whole kind of the, the back and forth, the two way kind of proposition of becoming part of the Sakai community uh, for a uh, private entity. And I was thinking more in terms of like, um, you know, the group that's cons consistently working on um, developing and maintaining and uh, enhancing all the various different tools and um, whether, you know, there would be individuals from those private entities that would want to be part of that process or would be willing to be part of that process, mm -hmm. or if it would just strictly be a financial arrangement, they, they buy in to use the Sakai right. system and that's all it is. My, my sense is that um, they would if uh, there would be individuals who would buy in, um, just, just having been in private industry for a long time in my career, my sense is there would be individuals who would buy in. The question would be, would their, um, would their employer sanction the idea of them spending time doing that? Time is money. So in other words, would they contribute to it? You know, it'd be one thing to write a check. It'd be another thing to say, yes, I'll allow John to go off to um, Sakai camp um, in January, and I'll let John be a part of this, and I'll let him spend uh, 20 hours a week coding um, for something that is going to be open source and offered back to everybody for free. Oh, I don't think I can do that. You know, I, I can see that being a difficult yeah. argument. Yeah, and if you tied it to professional development somehow, or I mean, a lot of corporations are willing to invest in continual education, yes, continuing education, true. professional development. So I guess it's all in how you frame it or pack mm -hmm. it or present it. So, yeah. Dan, what, I, I, I don't know you, so you got to weigh in here, my friend. Audio mute, currently a muted. He took himself off mute, but I'm not sure. You mean Dave? Or are you waiting for me? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I got the wrong all name. Right, right. I got the wrong. It's D. I should just call you D. <laughs> That's fine. All right. Yeah. Dave. Um, all right. I'm yeah, writing I, Dave down so I won't get it wrong. <laughs> I sympathize with the, um, you know, I, I know that I struggle with my management um, on the idea of contributing back. Um, a problem that I sort of solved by, you know, you know, participating in the community discussions and hey, if somebody needs help with something, you know, try to pitch in and all that. So I mean, it, it does have that benefit. Um, mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you know, some of the things that we've done, you know, enhancements that we've come up with are 
they're unique to us. Uh, yeah. They're yeah. unique to our business case. Um, I'm not sure the community would really be that interested. Maybe they would, but you know, yeah. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. So there's that. It's so uh, there are some challenges. Yeah. Laura, we have not heard from you. You have to you have to weigh in on this because I, I know this about Laura. Her husband probably has a, a different perspective than she has because of the work that he does. So what does Laura think? Yeah, this is an interesting topic uh, because there are corporations who, I mean, there are there are tools that are already in this space for mm -hmm. corporate training. Um, to my knowledge, none of them have been lauded as being the end all and the be all. The one that HR uses here at Notre Dame is, um, it's a good, um, so they've combined the functionality of um, performance mat management and professional development tracking and then as a platform for delivering, um, you know, they're usually canned modules, but um, we haven't gotten in the habit of using that system for that purpose because uh, people dislike it so much. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the kind of ability to build training or to um, customize training uh, pretty much it's just input a SCORM module. Yeah. So, um, so I know that there are uh, corporate training systems out there that Sakai can beat the pants off of. Uh, but, but I also know, too, right? I mean, Sakai, because it can do so many things, I find that when I talk to a corporate trainer, they go, no, I just wanted to do you know, this and spit out a certificate at the end. And I go, yeah, but, you know, let's talk about pedagogy. Like, I don't want to talk about pedagogy. I just want it to do this, this, and this and spit out a certificate at the end. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of a challenging conversation, but. Um, yeah, yeah, it is. Um, to the developer question, I really think that people looking for this kind of a solution are in a, a market silo, if you will, that, uh, will not contribute so much in the developer kind of thing. It, it will be individuals, not the company itself, uh, unless they, um, they have some kind of a grant program or some kind of a charitable giving thing, and it behooves them to be associated with, with open source that way. I think the, the uh, niche that this, that your product and service I mean, it really is a product, right? It's a it's a slice of Sakai that meets that size to your smallest needs. One course yeah. or right. ten courses. Uh, it probably doesn't size well to to large trainings. So if you had a very large company who wanted to do put twenty thousand employees through the same course, uh, that would probably might, yeah, not, I mean, not be your that. core tar your core no audience. it's definitely not our it's not the lamp consortium's core target that's for sure um although you know i i am quick to say this is part of my spiel when i'm talking to people well the largest implementation of sakai is at the university of south africa with two hundred eighty thousand students so sakai scales quite well um you think you have more than two hundred eighty thousand? now i did have one guy say well yeah worldwide we have more than that employees <laughs> but Okay, <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> but um, I, I put topic five on the screen. Um, I'll go back to topic four because Laura made me think of it. In what ways would the Sakai community need to change to work better with these non-academic educators? And one thing that's already come to me, and I think Joe is what made me think about it, is we would have to do a better job of articulating what it's like to work with open source, what it means to be a part of the open source community, and begin to I hesitate to say this because it sounds kind of forceful, but break down this notion that they probably come to the table with that would make them sort of anti-open um, source. I, I often have to explain, even to my members who by all rights should get it, um, you, you could pay for that. You know, We could hire somebody to develop that for us, but understand that we would give it to everybody. 
uh, because that's just the way it works. And they kind of want to go, no, it's mine. And I'm like, well, yeah, but you know, why not share it? You know, it's, you need it, let's get it built. Um, and we'll go from there. So there's, there's question around that. And let me go back to, to number four, um, in what ways would the Sakai software itself need to change in order to work better for non-academic non -academic educators? So that's, I kind of wanted to wrap up with, so what, you know, what would we need to do if we really wanted to go down this road even more? Um, and I'm not sure that's even clear to you all that we want to do that. I do just because of the niche that we're in, but I, I realized we may be in a minority and it should just stay that way, or it may be this is the beginning of something really wonderful. I will take comments now. <laughs> I know that this is Dave again. Yeah. Um, we have, you know, just because of our model, uh, a different scenario in regard to how content gets created. Um, you know, I'm sure in the university setting is, you know, professors have, you know, a great deal of latitude about, you know, when they do things, you know, how they do them and all that. Whereas we have, you know, a, a cadre of curriculum people that that's what they do all day long. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, some, some of the tools that, you know, that we've come up with, let them, you know, publish things really quickly. Um, you know, particularly like, like in Samago tests and quizzes, you know, that they can just publish in bulk. Um, so, you know, th those are the kinds of things that I think about uh, yeah. where, yeah, it would work better for us if those tools were already there. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I hope that explains it, but yeah. Well, it, it does. Uh, and, uh, and Laura, um, you, you've been working on a project at Notre Dame for a couple of years now that have to do with replication of courses um, and, and what I'm thinking of, Dave, is that yeah. uh, what, I, what I tend to recommend to folks is, you know, build a, what I'm going to call a template course, but don't enroll students in that. And then you replicate mm -hmm. that. And that's the one you, you enroll your students in. But in the replication process, there are some things could be done that would make it a lot less painful. Um, I had a woman call me just the other day. She said, so I have, um, was it discussion forums or was it something else? No, it was assignments. I have, you know, 50 assignments in this course and I've replicated it now and I have to go and publish every one of them. Do I have to do that one at a time? Mm -hmm. And the answer yeah. is, uh, yeah, you do. Yeah. You know, and I'm thinking it, 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 that would be a really good tool to be able to say publish all boom and we're done. Yeah, that, and, um, and just like you can do as I course, say, that's you know, exactly you, what you we've done in, in San Diego yeah. and, and with exactly that, that case, that use case, if you will, where okay, we've got a template. So yeah, let's, let's say that we've got a student now that you know, has a, a, as I said, a sports injury or something like that. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, well, we can replicate the full course. Right. And then we can pull out what we don't want for that student. Right. And now, you know, when it comes to publishing all the tests and all that, you just click and say publish all and bam, you know, it does it for you. So, you know, Bingo. as I say, that's one thing we've come up with that helps us. Yeah. Well, it, it would help. It would help us too. So share that, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our owner is a lawyer, and he tends to, you know, err on on very conservative. No, 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 no. You can't. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. Gym, you know, I got you. I got you. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it's yeah. a it's a tough world. So yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, Laura, we're getting close on time. I'm thinking. We sure are, and I just wanted to thank you for leading this birds of a feather presentation. Uh, we've had some very good conversation, and I will give you a big hand of applause. Oh, here we go. I'm going to get the... <laughs> um, Let me say that if, if you are interested in this notion of, um, yeah, okay, they can stand up as long as they like. <laughs> Um, if, you're, if you're interested in, in this notion of the non-academic educators becoming a part of the Sakai community, you know, let's keep the conversation going because I think, I think there's a, I think there's a future here. And, um, and on that note, yeah. on that note, so, I will yeah. end the recording. Thank okay. you, Martin. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. <laughs>